Hello, I'm Sachi Inari Rizzo here at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. I'm curator of prints and drawings, and every other month I present a talk in the Print and Drawing Study Center and offer it both in person and virtually. For this season, we have been looking at the post-World War II print renaissance in the U.S., seen in the proliferation of printmaking workshops, their interconnections, and the artists with whom they are making some of the most exciting prints that we see today. In September, we looked at the pioneering organizations ULAE, Pratt Graphic Art Center, and Tamarin Institute, the pioneers of the print revival who reinvigorated lithography. One difference between these organizations is their for-profit or non-profit status. For the nonprofits like Tamarin and Pratt, education was a key part of their missions. Both eventually affiliated themselves with a parent organization at a school of higher learning. Margaret Lohengren of the Contemporaries Graphic Arts Center partnered with Pratt Institute, a private university known for its fine arts program. As a nonprofit organization, she received a $55,000 grant from the Rockefeller Foundation. Pratt Graphic Arts Center did not clearly define its relationship with the art program and struggled financially. In 1986, it closed. Tamarin Lithography Workshop received multiple generous grants from the Ford Foundation. Their final grant helped them transition into Tamarin Institute of the University of New Mexico, which helped stabilize their financial support. While part of their budget is through the university, the other portion is through the sale of their published prints and contract printing. They continue to offer graduate classes to students at the university, and they maintain a robust master printing training program that we discussed back in November. Today, we will look at some print shops that are or were affiliated with colleges and universities. In doing so, they had to maintain a tricky balance between education and entre entrepreneurship. Graphic Studio was founded by Donald Saff in 1968 as a research institution at the University of South Florida from the beginning. Graphic Studio's chop mark is a sunburst that we see to the left. When a print shop makes a print, their unique chop mark is generally embossed in the margin. Initially, the sunburst signified energy, but now seems to symbolize also renewal brought about by the great variety of projects, frequent influx of visiting artists, and even the periodic changes in staff and leadership. Donald Saff was the Dean of the College of Fine Arts and founder of Graphic Studio. In, 19, in 1978, Graphic Studio was the subject of an exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum. Just four years after opening, it featured around 140 prints, drawings, portfolios, and multiples. Graphic Studio's independence and lack of strict connections with the university and consequently inconsistent university funding led to its closure in 1979. It reopened in 1980 with a grant from the Florida's legislature. Its new oversight included the chair of the art department, director of the university, and staff. The new graphic studio proposed a dual mission of both teaching and research like Tamarin. They would have a more intimate relationship with the university, including student internships and guest artists involved in academics. In return, the University Art Museum actively exhibited and acquired their prints. Other departments in the university became available resources as needed. Funding is provided by both the state and sale of prints. To support research, educational programs, and projects, the community can su subscribe to a print collection program as well. The Research Partners Program is limited to 35 members. Founder Donald Saff, pictured on the left, brought on, brought on board master printers from Tamarin. Robert Rauschenberg and James Rosenquist were repeat visiting artists to Graphic Studio. Back when Tatiana Grossman at ULAE first approached Rauschenberg about making prints, Rauschenberg's comment sh shows his mindset back then. He said, the second half of the 20th century is no time to start write writing on rocks, referring to lithography stone matrix. About two decades later in 1986, Rauschenberg described Graphic Studio as a place to exchange creative thoughts and ideas with some of the best artists in the world, and that kind of exchange is invaluable in one's own creative process. The hallmark of Graphic Studio was and is innovation and experimentation, complete with specialized equipment and a team of experts in printmaking. Also, they had resources across the campus from different disciplines known for their research. 
In 1990, Donald Saff worked with the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. to house the Graphic Studios archives. And this, this work by New York artist Leslie Dill is a recent donation by a Fort Wayne resident. It is the only work for the museum that owns, uh, that, that be, it's the only work at, that the museum owns that was published by Graphic Studio. While artists can explore traditional printmaking techniques at Graphic Studio, they can also create three-dimensional works in a range of materials like bronze, steel, wood, and rubber, and they are made in multiples in a limited edition. Dill brings language into her sculpture, installations, and prints. Oftentimes, she integrates the poetry of another American woman artist, Emily Dickinson. Dill creates works that feel at once fragile, but also indestructible. She transitioned from wood to paper when she and her husband lived in India in the 1990s. From a practical standpoint, paper was transportable, but it possessed that quality of fragility and strength that she desired, like humanity. An early inspiration was the sculpted work of Alberto Giacometti. In 1990, Dill was given a book of Emily Dickinson's poetry, which was piv a pivotal moment in her art. The poet's emotive phrasing stands out in her work, as in the print on the right published by Tamron Institute, incorporating Dickinson's poem, Exhilaration is Within. Dill exhibits her love of language as she gives poem fragments visual form. Words don't lie flat like on a page of a book. Sometimes the letters and words are imprinted on body parts as on the right or on dresses or even float and spill out into space as if uttered. Dill's residency at Graphic Studio yielded a number of innovative works. In copper poem hands, the copper plate that would be used to make an etching print is patinaed and is the piece instead of a printed impression on paper. Dill often uses thread, but in this case she used wire. She created a related print as well in 1994 with a single pair of hands entitled Red Poem Hands. Dill often uses body parts related to our senses, ears, mouth, eyes, and in this, in this example, hands for touch. The words in between the two pairs of hands are the first lines of Dickinson's poem reading, I felt my life with both hands to see if it was there. Although it takes a team to run a printmaking workshop, there is usually one individual who is key to its establishment, like Donald Saff with Graphic Studio. Such is the case with Rudy Pizzotti and Echo Press in Bloomington, Indiana. In 1956, Pizzotti moved to Indiana University's School of Fine Arts, where he spent the rest of his ac academic career, retiring in 1991. He is recognized for building the foundation of IU's well-known printmaking program. IU was a rich environment for printmaking. Besides Pizzotti, he had printmaking colleagues Mar Marvin Lowe and Wendy Kalman over the years. There was interest in prints on the part of Henry Hope, the chair of the department, and Dieter Thim, art historian faculty. Also, IU's art museum boasts a strong collection of graphic arts. In 1963, Pizzotti spent two and a half months working at Tamarin Lithography Free Workshop, where he also became close friends with workshop directors Clinton Adams and Ira Antresian, who had taught at Heron School of Art in Indi Indianapolis. At Tamarin, Pizzotti worked with master printers, which provided him with an in-depth experience in lithography and enabled him to add lithography as a class. He also took note on how Tamarin operated. In Europe, collaborative print shops were common and Pizzotti worked in Rome for a medieval bestiary project. He studied woodblock printing at Adachi Institute in Tokyo. There, he experienced the collaborative nature of Japan's woodblock print tradition, which includes the work of the artist, block cutter, printer, and publisher. Pazzotti was friends with Jack Lemon, owner of Landfall Press. He visited there for special commissions. Pazzotti met David Keister. Keister worked as a printer for Landfall Press on projects with Christo, Robert Cottingham, um, Klaus Oldenburg, just to name a few. Landfall Press's schedule was hectic. In its first seven months, they printed 87 editions. After three years of fast-paced working at Landfall, Keister left to complete his MFA in printmaking and photography at IU in 1976. While finishing up his degree, Keister and Pizzotti discussed the possibility of establishing a print workshop in which Keister would serve as master printer and Pizzotti would handle the funding. 
The twosome created a print to commemorate IU's recent NIT basketball championship co coached by Bobby Knight. The revenue from the sales went to purchasing litho stones and towards a new litho press. Echo Press was officially founded in 1979 and began initially as a lithography print shop. Important financial support came through the Indiana, Indiana University Foundation. Echo Press was fortunate that it did not have to depend entirely on sales to cover their budget, particularly in its early years. Many print shops folded within, without this type of financial investment. Pegram Harrison, included in this group photo on the right, played an, an, a different important role at Echo Press. She took on many of the business aspects, whether it was securing sales, strategically getting their prints placed in museum collections, and working with artists. Echo Press played an educational role by providing internships not only to IU students, but also students from other institutions. Classes outside the art department utilize Echo Press as a resource, including classes in journalism and law, even. Echo Press was known for inviting young, emerging artists working across the country. Initially, Echo Press brought in visiting artists slash teachers for one month. They tended to be guest artists in Pazzotti's classes, so they were printmakers. The requirements changed to, to a time period of just one to two weeks, with the added opportunity to present a lecture on their work to students. This change allowed for a wider field of artists from which to choose. Oftentimes, they selected artists who resisted stylistic categorization. Many artists didn't arrive with printmaking backgrounds and sought to achieve aesthetic qualities in keeping with their other work. This presented challenges to Master Print at Keister who re to recommend ways to accomplish this. In the case of David Shapiro, pictured here working with Keister, he made the transition from painter to printmaker. Echo Press operated with one press in a 900 square foot uh, space until 1990. Enticing artists to leave their studios in major cities like New York was a challenge, but Echo Press's finished work spoke for itself. They exuded a spirit of experimentation. In Pegram Harrison's recollections, she talked about how she identified artists whose work shared an affinity with the lithography medium. Harrison felt this in April Gornick's drawings and could easily see that the artists work see the artists working in litho crayon on stone. On the right, we have um, Gornick's charcoal and pastel drawing expanding storm. On the left is light at the source created at Echo Press. Lithography offered a subtle range of tones, which is key to Gornick's work. Light at the Source was Gornick's first lithograph. Although a landscape, the artist chose a vertical format as the dark, threatening clouds billow upwards. Despite its simple black and white appearance, the lithograph was actually made in four colors, pink, gray, dull black, and black. It was made on two stones and three aluminum plates. Dennis Cardin's work, Pleasure and Power, presents us with a different type of realism. His naturalistic figuration is to the degree that it captures the hairs and pores on skin. Cardin's close-up view and cropping is unusual. While highly individualistic, it is not personal or showing the psychology of the person. In contrast to Gornick's Light at the Source that was done in litho crayon, Cardin has made his image through liquid touche in three colors. In approaching Cardin's works and others, Master Printer Keister didn't continually consult technical manuals, but drew on his years of experience. He also approached pro projects with a flexible attitude. He said, here at Echo, I was never unwilling to try something simply because I had never done it before. Here we were in Bloomington, Indiana, away from the mainstream, trying to attract artists to come to the hinterlands of the middle Midwest to make prints. He continued, what is it that we can offer that, them that they can't get anywhere else? So I just said yes to everything. That spirit of experimentation for pleasure and power, power resulted in Keister and printer Dave Calkins search all over Bloomington for salt. They found eight different types of salt that they could add to touche to create a gritty wash. They used it on the litho matrix to absorb moisture. They were looking to create a dense speckled pattern. While Gornick and Cardin's works here were done exclusively in lithograph, Brett De Palma appreciated the inherent qualities in all processes. In four corners of the world, De Palma chose to work in multiple mediums, including lithography, etching in aquatint, 
lino cut, and wood cut. Lithographic touche and aquatint form painterly washes for clouds but result in slightly different qualities. The wood grain from the wood block was enhanced by a wood a wire brush and appears especially in the lower right quadrant. Smooth black fields thanks to lino cut, um, or th thanks to lino cut, and the etching needle yielded delicate lines. The scale of the print is, a, is large at 52 by 41 inches. With limitations posed by the size of the printing press bed, they were able to achieve a larger scale by printing on four sheets forming four different quadrants. An example of Keister's contribution as master printer was how he developed the skill of being able to match the color the artist was seeking. To give them a starting point, Keister would create a color sample book of printing inks. As he worked with artists, he would get a better feeling for the artist's preferred palette, anticipating their needs. Color is important in Stephen Sorman's work here. The artist has, has had a long relationship with Echo Press beginning in 1982. His approach has been described as spontaneous without exacting preconceived ideas. Often he would begin with developing a lexicon of images on plates, stones, or blocks. He would then figure out how to utilize these various elements. In Bohemian Flats, one, um, seen here, Sorman printed dark looping ribbons that can be faintly seen through the subsequent chincole layer, layer um, which is a thin layer of paper. Sorman overprinted with additional biomorphic shapes that overlap with the previous elements to form new colors. Even the grain of the woodcut is picked up by the Japanese paper used in chincole. He takes advantage of the translucency of the Japanese paper that mutes the underlying colors to create a sense of depth. Hardin and Gornick were in the represent representational camp. Sormon was at the opposite pole with gestural abstraction. Echo Press sought out artists who fell outside of these extremes as well. Michael Byron's prints shared an affinity with his paintings at the time, which consisted of four colorful panels in the background set off by a collaged image in the center. In Who Remembers Adam, um, and that one's on the right, the central image is a photolithograph taken from a German book on puppets. The figure is controlled by larger hands from above, and a tree is set on the tableau, like, a, like the tableau-like stage. It gives the piece a mysterious but also ominous tone. The central image in For the People of Mexico on the left reproduces a period photograph of Pancho Villa, the Mexican revolutionary leader on horseback. He confidently rides towards the camera as if in a film still from a Hollywood movie. Francisco Pancho Villa is best known for leading attack on Columbus, a New Mexico border town and military camp in 1916. Um, although the U.S. Army tried to track him for 11 months, Vietnam was never captured. And it is arguable whether he was a hero or a violent criminal. However, today, Mexico regards Villa as a hero, romanticized into a mythic figure through folklore. In 1990, Echo Press relocated to a 3,400-square-foot 3, facility with a new Intaglio Press, expanding their capabilities over that 900-square-foot space. In January through March 1992, the Fort Wayne Museum of Art hosted an exhibition celebrating 10 years of prints at Echo Press. The 1990s ushered in Echo Press's facility expansion, which also meant increased expense expenses. Grant support declined and the print market collapsed. In 1993, the IU Foundation informed the print shop that they would no longer provide an annual allocation, which made up one third of their budget. Echo Press needed to be self-sustainable. Sadly, Echo Press closed after 16 years of operation. In that time, they created a total of 191 editions, 400 monotypes, and worked with 47 artists. Tandem Press opened in 1987 as a result of the strong printmaking program at University of Wisconsin-Madison that developed after World War II. It was a reflection of the growth in printmaking workshops in the country and also the extraordinary market for prints in the 1980s. Many art galleries and dealers began to focus on prints and they commanded high prices at auction. Um, I like the, the name of, the, their, of Tandem Press. Um, the word tandem to me alludes to the collaborative nature of graphic arts between the artists and the printers. 
Tandem Press's founder was William Ouija, who joined the UW-Madison faculty in 1971 after receiving his MFA there. Before Tandem Press, Ouija opened his own print workshops on his farm property um, from 1971 to 81. Ouija convinced the School of Education of the value of a print workshop to students. Um, this collaborative environment would be a training ground and provide exposure to visiting professional artists. Tandem still exists today and is affiliated with UW-Madison's art department with oversight from the School of Education. Its mission is part educational and professional print business. Visiting artists give lectures to students in the community. They also participate in studio visits and critiques. Tandem also uses students in internships, work-study positions, and project assistance to learn the ins and outs of making plates and printing. The prestige of the university's print program was helpful in attracting established artists during Tandem's early years. The expertise of their faculty, including Jack Dahmer in lithography, Francis Meyer in intaglio, and Raymond Glecker in woodcut was invaluable. Ouija made Tandem attractive by having an Italio press built that was the largest in the country. Tandem worked with high prof profile artists like Chuck Close and it printed for Pace Editions. A schedule developed annually with a mix of one artist from the faculty, one from the region, and five to six throughout the nation. Tandem has a gallery as well that supports the sale of prints to help the program, pro program be self-sufficient. Invited artists were paid an honorarium, per diem, and some prints from the edition. When the print market began to slow down, Tandem added Paula Panchenko, who creatively reevaluated the practices by experts in the field and students at the School of B Business. Tandem still continues today and approximately 85% of their budget is provided by print sales, 10% from fundraising, and 5% from the School of Education. Trudy Hansen um, came to Tandem to provide administrative support after setting up an archive of, of Echo Press's work with Indiana University Art Museum, now today, today known as the Eskenazi Museum of Art. Hansen suggested that Tandem's archives be um, housed at the Chazen Museum of Art in Madison, Wisconsin. She eventually moved on to the Zimmerle Museum at Rutgers University that had their own print workshop as well. Bad Kitty by Richard Bozeman is a woodcut created at Tandem. Bozeman came to prominence during the 1970s and 80s he was associated with figurative works by neo-expressionists that were characterized by emotional expressiveness and were highly subjective. They marked a return to narrative imagery. Bozeman is known for freezing a pivotal moment, a technique inspired by film and comic strips. Sometimes it is a dramatic seascape, a murder mystery, or in this case when an owner has caught her cat doing something naughty. We just see the red nails of the owner holding up the cat seen in profile. Drops of blood dripping from Kitty's claws match the owner's red painted nails. Kitty's eyes are wide open, either shocked by being suddenly picked up or still sharing, staring at his prey. There is a sense of realism, and yet there isn't a lot of detail. The cat is largely black mass and some white lines delineating ears, whiskers, and some hairs. Bozeman created additional prints exploring Kitty's exploits and monotype during his visit to Tandem. In these works, the cat is up in a tree and we see the same truncated, outstretched hand with painted nails. One year later, Bozeman was making images of the black cat when he returned to the print studio. Steven Sorman has worked in many of the major printmaking studios, including Echo Press, Tyler Graphics, and here Tandem. During Steven Sorman's visit to Tandem in 1997, he worked on a series of nine prints entitled In Step, Out of Step. We own number four which is the only one that incorporated lithography, woodcut, and intaglio print processes. They all share a similar two-part stacked format. In each section, Sorman overlays linear pattern forms that gracefully pull and twist over fields of glowing color. And here's the rest of the series. Other examples of print workshops affiliated with academic institutions include Illinois State University and Normal Illinois, humorously named Normal Editions. It was conceived by faculty member James Butler, Harold Boyd, and Raymond George in 1976 and continues to operate today. The Leroy Neiman Center, for, Center at the School of Arts at Columbia University is another example. 
It was founded through a generous endowment from Leroy and Janet Neiman in 1996 to promote printmaking through education, production, and the, ex the exhibition of prints. Um, I am ending with this triptych by Willie Cole that is currently on view in the permanent collection exhibition Beyond Face Value. It was published by Rutgers Center for Innovative Print and Paper, now known as the Brodsky, Brodsky Art Center at Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art. The Brodsky Center was established in 1986 at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey in New Brunswick. It was named actually the Rutgers Center for Innovative Print and Paper and then re renamed the Brodsky Center in 2006 in honor of its founding director, Judith Brodsky. But her vision centered around supporting artists whose work had been overlooked in the mainstream art world. So they tended to work with many women artists and artists of color. And then in 2018, the Brodsky Center joined the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art, where print and paper are still a core curricular um, mediums. And so thank you for joining me this month. Um, please join me on Wednesday, March 13th, when we will continue this series and we will look at workshops and their relationship with the community, including self-help graphics and Coronado Studios.